Welcome back to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Today's guest is Calgary's Ward 3 candidate, Nate Pike. Nate, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much for having me on. Uh, Nate, my first question to all the guests that I have on the show uh, is, where does your sense of duty come from? Um, wow, that's a big question. Uh, that you, right out the gate. <laughs> you're going to get a long-winded answer on that one. I apologize right out of the gate for that. <laughs> Go for it. It comes from a bunch of different places. Um, I have always had a bit of a propensity for tilting at windmills. Uh, it's just been a character defect of mine for quite some time. Um, so I, I, I don't like bullies um, because I, I, when I was a kid, I experienced a lot of bullying. So I, I had a taste, as he says, from his middle-aged white male position of privilege, I had a taste of what it was like to feel powerless at a very young age. Uh, and I did not like it one bit. Uh, and unfortunately, we have no shortage of people who like to lord their power over other people, uh, regardless of the consequence. And so that's, that's sort of the where I would argue that it first came from. Um, my parents were both uh, public servants. My mom was a nurse. My dad was is still actually uh, a teacher. And so there's always been that sort of mentality of moving things forward. Um, and, and that doesn't come without work. Uh, so that would be the, the, the first answer. This, the second answer would be, I've got two boys. Uh, I have two kids who are, are young. Um, and I'm a big believer that the, that comes with the responsibility of trying to make sure, A, that the world that they get is better um, but I think it also comes from there's a place of responsibility that exists where I don't want to just raise two kids who are good at Minecraft or hockey or or whatever I want I want to raise two kids who who will continue my values of trying to make things better and I can't do that without doing it by example first uh, the, the, the last place that I'll say, because otherwise I'm just going to take up your whole podcast with this answer. Hey, uh, if you didn't talk, it'd be a shitty podcast. <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> um, I've, I've been, uh, I've been working as a paramedic for coming up to 12 years now. Um, and with that, a, I have had the, the, the privilege of serving in some truly remarkable situations, but I also have gotten a front row seat to what inequity and inequality yield. Uh, and so it's just, I'm not somebody who can sit back and go, well, that guy's suffering, but I'm not, so it's fine. Uh, that, that to me, if, if, if you turn your back on, on that sort of thing, then you're complicit in whatever causes it as far as I'm concerned. So, and then the, the, I'm so bad at that's the last thing I'll say. And then I say another thing. Um, but the last thing that I'll say as well is that I, I am, I am definitely aware of the, the, the privilege that I have. Uh, I have a stable, secure job. Um, I have, uh, a wife and kids. I'm a middle-aged white dude, uh, which comes with, uh, um, and, uh, not only that I'm a cis straight middle-aged white dude. So like, I, I have more privilege than the average bear by a long shot. And with the realization and the awareness of that privilege, I think comes a responsibility to try to balance the scales a little bit for people who don't come with that kind of privilege. Now, we have a lot to unpack there just in those first three and a half minutes of the opening <laughs> podcast. But let's talk about your upbringing a little bit here. Were you, was your family political or are you sort of the odd man out with the political gene? Because I, you, you, this is not your first foyer into politics. So are you, is this your, are you the sort of black sheep of a family when it comes to politics? In, in a backwards way. So my, my grandfathers on both sides were extremely political. Uh, my, my grandfather on my mom's side, uh, he was the, the mayor of a small town called Tabor uh, yep. for, for quite some time. Uh, he ran the, uh, the newspaper there and owned the newspaper there for quite some time. Um, my grandfather on my dad's side has always, was always very political. Uh, he was one of the founding members of the reform party. Uh, so, and there's the, there's the black sheep part kind of starting to kick in. Wow. So when I was, when I was a kid, um, I was also raised in a, a very 
faith-based upbringing is what I'll say. Uh, and I definitely went through a, a bit of a rebellion phase on that. So my political activities up until probably six years ago were, were largely more on the, the activist side of things um, because I didn't like the, the constraint structure that comes with political parties. I thought I'd give it a try uh, and, and, and learn some things in that process. Um, but uh, I have always been fairly politically minded. Um, both of my, my grandfather on my dad's side fought in World War II. Uh, my grandfather on my mother's side was a radio operator for Canada, the Canadian forces inside of Canada. So while he wasn't actually military, he was only not military because he had some physical limitations. Uh, and so he found every way that he possibly could to still contribute to the effort. Uh, and I was very, very much raised with the idea that if we don't learn from history, we're bound to repeat it. And for a very long time, the best way for me to push back against that as a uh, young punk rocker uh, was through the activism uh, pathway. Uh, and then I got older and uh, my knees started to hurt a little bit more. So <laughs> I shifted gears a bit. So uh, what do you mean by activism? Because uh, when, uh, if you say activism today, you are thinking going out protesting at downtown Calgary in downtown streets of Edmonton. What is activism to you? And explain a little bit how what you mean by your type of act activism. So the there were certain. I don't want to use the word causes, but I'm going to because my brain's not working properly. Uh, there were certain causes that I was very much drawn to. Uh, one of the the biggest ones for me was because I had a couple of uh, female friends who experienced it was violence towards women, um, and so I spent. Gosh, it was only because of COVID that, that I stopped doing them, but I think I did 12 years running of benefit concerts for the Calgary Women's Emergency Shelter. Um, I have also been very outspoken and, and have attended protests for, uh, in particularly, uh, LGBTQ 2S plus issues, uh, because that, I'm so tired of that conversation. Like I, you I just, and me both, <laughs> you and me both. And that's coming from me. <laughs> it's just so dumb. Like, yeah, I'll, I'll, if, if you want to unpack that one, we can later. But yeah. the, the fact that we're still having that conversation in any capacity in 2021 is just both enraging and heartbreaking to me. Um, so I, I, I have I've had the privilege of marching in a pride parade. I took my kids with me on that one. Um, I have definitely attended many protests, but the, the interesting thing for me to give full disclosure here is um, about eight years ago now uh, with my role as paramedic, uh, I was actually, I have the privilege of being part of the Calgary Police Services Public Safety Unit as a paramedic for them. Wow. And so for me, the, the protest piece isn't just about the um, whatever the given cause is. Uh, to me, the ability to protest is, is foundational to the, the fabric of who we are as a country. And so it's, it's, I, I get a lot of joy and satisfaction out of being able to, on one day, being a part of the protest, and on another day, being part of the infrastructure that's working to make sure the protests can continue to happen safely. We... We are currently, and you know as well as I do, because you're the one actually running and your name's going to be on the ballot here in the next election, uh, municipal election, but we are in the process of a uh, municipal election. You are deciding to run for Ward 3. What was that decision based on? What was the ultimate final uh, factor that said, you know what, this is the year that I need to put my name on the ballot because I believe X is an important issue that we should be talking about? There there were a lot of things that, that led up to it. I mean, I, to be perfectly clear, the... The final factor was my wife said yes. Um, <laughs> if I if I didn't have her uh, approval and and blessing, there's no way that I would have done it. Um, so, just to be clear on that part, um, <laughs> but there there were a lot of different factors that led into it. Um, one of the the protests that I attended had to do with the fact that I have very real concerns about the introduction of the the dark money that we're seeing in campaigns. Um, the, the latitude that PACs and slates have been given is, is really, really alarming to me. Uh, and I actually spoke at a couple of protests last year about that. Uh, so I'm, part of it was I'm a big put your money where your mouth is kind of person. 
Uh, and so if I'm going to say this is bad and we have to stand up to it, I kind of have to stand up to it. Um, but in regards to the, I think the biggest piece for me was I was approached by several members of our community that I, I really respect uh, and who are able to tell me when I'm doing a big thing badly. Uh, and they strongly uh, encouraged and asked me to run because I do have in, in my community, I do have a long history of volunteering for the community and, and fundraising and all of the things. And they, I think that there's a very real concern that we're starting to see an invasion of partisan politics into the municipal level. Uh, it's certainly one of my big concerns. And with that comes the introduction in ways that I don't think we've seen before of candidates who are running not because they care about their communities, not because they want to see their communities move forward. Uh, cough, green line, cough. Um, <laughs> we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Don't worry. <laughs> Excellent. Um, but they're 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 there just to serve a partisan purpose, and and that is is troubling to me, and I think it's very troubling to a lot of the the people who asked me to run. So I thought about it for quite a while. It's it's a very different step, I think, than a lot of people take in their political careers. Uh, most people go municipal, then provincial. I went provincial, lit the whole thing on fire, and now I'm going municipal. Uh, so <laughs> it's just it's keep a, on going. <laughs> it's a bit backwards. Um, yeah. But no, it, it, I really do want to make sure, I mean, we've, Ward 3 has been very fortunate in that we have had for the last few years, a counselor who has been very active in the community, who has been uh, very vocal about our issues. And I, I want to see that momentum built upon and increased, not lost. Well, and that's, that's, it's a good jumping off point because it's an area that I want to talk about briefly because uh, one of the reasons I want people on the show is to ask them this question and it's to quote my favorite uh, movie, Wrath of Khan, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Or the one. Or the one. <laughs> but we won't talk about James Kirk here for a second. We're just going to yeah. stick it to Nimoy. Um, <laughs> you were there, if you were the successful candidate on October 18th, yeah. you were there to represent Calgary. You were there elected by the people of Ward 3, but you were there to represent all of Calgary because that is our ward-based system. Our ward-based system is you are elected at a ward, but at the end of the day, you were there to represent all of Calgary. You need to think about everyone. So how do you envision yourself looking after everyone, but also not forgetting the people who have put you there? Well, I think there's a bit of a hierarchy that's involved. I mean, for sure, any city councillor represents the 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 city. There's, I mean, it's a, you're you're a city councillor, so mm -hmm. it's it's in the name. Um, but I think that there's a there's a hierarchy in in my head, at least. Um, the the first people that that any elected official should advocate for most aggressively are the areas that they were elected to represent. And I would be happy to argue that Ward 3 is has to be that first priority. I do not believe, and I, I take great exception with the notion that a ward councillor representing both their ward and their city are mutually exclusive. I think that that's an incredibly short-sighted way of looking at things. Um, but I think for, for me, the biggest priority is making sure that, that Ward 3's concerns and voices are heard and then are integrated with the, the the greater plan for the city so what are you hearing because i know in your campaign oh you are i know but you, you aren't doing the traditional campaign because of covid19 restrictions yet again this is airing in uh, august so it could change by the time that gets there but as of right now as of recording the last week full week of may you're not doing the traditional canvassing of door knocking and all that. So what are you hearing from the people you are talking to about their concerns that aren't being addressed at city hall? Uh, gratitude that I'm not door knocking for one. <laughs> um, there, there are, there, there is at least one candidate that is, and I really do owe them a thank you because the, I, I've gotten several <laughs> emails from, and, and, and messages from people saying this person just showed up at my door. I'm super unimpressed. What can I do to help you? Um, wow. So that's, that's cool. Uh, but in regards to the issues that are, are directly impacting the ward, there's there's some that I think are are definitely at the forefront. There's there's no way to have the conversation about Ward Three in the North Central Corridor without talking about the Green Line, um, because there is a 
and this gets into a much bigger conversation, but there is a huge infrastructure deficit that exists all across Calgary. Um, but it, we certainly feel it particularly strongly in Ward 3 and, and transit is a big part of that. So the, the green line and what are going to be the transitional stages to make sure that the transit deficit is addressed uh, and make sure that Ward 3 has accessible and reliable transit, that's probably one of the biggest conversations. Um, after that, property taxes are huge. Uh, and the, the commitment that I've made is that I won't be voting for any increase in property taxes until we're able to have a conversation with the province about how much revenue the city currently sends to the province because the the logic that i use is there's no question that we're living in exceptional times particularly for calgary because we've experienced the economic downturn as well as the impact of of covid19 and exceptional times do require exceptional measures and with that i do believe that there is a conversation for revisiting how much revenue calgary sends to the province um, at least during the recovery phase. I ideally, I'd like to see it on a much longer term, but I'll take what I can get. Um, but the property taxes is, is a big piece. Economic recovery as a whole is huge because there's a, a lot of people in Ward 3 fall into sort of the, the trades category. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why there's a lot of trades people are really upset about the green line being delayed and revised and all of the things because it represents very real jobs for a lot of people it's not just about transit it's it's about about jobs and i think it has an opportunity to be a integral part of our economic recovery but uh that's a, an opinion that is apparently not shared by everybody so uh especially people in edmonton for some reason you said it, not me. Um, hey, I, I, hey, I've said it a few times on this show that uh, yeah, I will wrong. be the first to admit that it seems that this is a political decision that is being weighed out until the after the municipal elections. And I, this is me going on the record as Chris Brown, not the candidate that I'm speaking to. So well, I'm probably news... saying the same thing. Uh, exactly. I mean, fundamentally, we've we've seen that. I mean, unfortunately, a lot of the information in regards to what has caused the delays and what the province is looking for has been discussed in in-camera meetings. So it's not terribly available to the public. Uh, and I'm still a member of the public. Uh, so there's there's challenges with knowing exactly what's going on, but certainly some of the, the statements that we've seen from both the mayor as well as current council seem to indicate that they've already provided all of this information. And this is very much a, a performative exercise. Uh, and I do find it disappointing that this is a, an issue that some people are choosing to play politics with in the run up to a municipal election. But we've got no shortage of those uh, going on as well. I mean, we've got the <laughs> arena as another one where uh, the number of times I have said, are you kidding me? Uh, is pretty much every time the arena comes up. <laughs> so I want to I want to backtrack here before we continue on with the green line and the of uh, the uh, arena. There's one area that you talked about and that I I just picked up on. That I want to talk about. You said you would not vote for a budget that has any increases to municipal property taxes until you talk to the province, yes. which is a which to to any person that sounds like a great point. But to me, the former city administrator who worked up in a northern community in Alberta, who shall not be named because of other reasons, um, you know that inflation happens. Inflation happens and you have to keep up with inflation. So in order to keep up with inflation and not pass a, a budget that has a, a, an increase to property taxes, you have to cut. You have to cut services or you have to cut areas. So any true journalist or any true podcast host would say, what areas are you looking at to potentially say, okay, we need to downsize this area or we need to reduce services here to offset that inflation increase? I think it's important to realize, I mean, if we're going to get into the minutiae here, I'm up for it, but- Let's do uh, it. Policy wonk here. <laughs> I think it's important to realize that when we're talking about the, the budget, the city's just released some information that suggests that at the very least, we've got a year, if not two years, before we have to seriously look at the possibility of raising property taxes, whether it be municipal or commercial. So we do have some time. I would like to think that there is, and, so, and, and I will give full credit to, to my current MLA, um, who I have had it's no secret that that I have significant philosophical differences on many issues with, um, but they've they have been 
very open to conversation uh, and they've been very open to collaboration uh, because one of the first things that I did uh, when I decided that I was going to run is I reached out to them and I said, um, hey, so I know that I have thrown many, many rocks at, at you and your party and I probably will continue to do so. Uh, but in the interests of getting the best for the communities that you represent and I potentially could represent, I think it's important that we have a positive working relationship and, and that MLA was very open to that. So I do believe that there is, it would be irresponsible to not look at options that, that don't create further economic hardship for the people of Ward 3 and Calgary uh, before voting for increases, I think. Uh, I think that it's unfortunate that the, the current environment in city council is so theatrical and hyperbolic and, and I'm going to use the word toxic because they have literally had to have mediators and counselors come in to mediate and counsel the counselors. Um, I'm not surprised that given that environment that those conversations haven't been initiated and haven't been productive. Um, but I would like to think that there is room for those conversations to be started. And if not, I think that, that again, it goes back to the idea that it would be irresponsible to not say that I've, I've pursued the big areas that I said that I was going to try to pursue. Uh, they have been unsuccessful. So now we have to have a different conversation. Well, and that's one of the key points on your on your website, uh, which we'll link to in the show notes at the end of the in the show notes. So to my listeners, go there and check out his website. But you also say you want to rebuild the trust between the people and the counselors. Yeah. And I, I, I've only been here for two years yet again. I'm a relatively newcomer to Calgary. So I've only seen the last two years of the theatrics, as you call it. And I talk to my neighbors, socially distanced as is. And you hear that the concerns aren't being met at City Hall. It's who can be the loudest and who can be the most exaggerated when it comes to the news and they get their 15 seconds on the news market, on the news channel. Yep. So how do you, as a potential future counselor, as the successful candidate on October 18th, change that narrative? Because that is not a one day process. That is going no, to be it's, a it's... year, two years. And in two years, people are running for reelection. Let's be honest. You have two years to get something done in municipal politics, in my opinion. I, so how do you change that? You're probably not wrong. Um, I think that there's there's a bunch of different ways that you can change that. And I'm trying to do some of them. Um, <clears throat> one of the, like I said, one of the driving factors for me getting involved uh, in this race was the fact that I'm very concerned about the, the campaign finance piece. I'm very concerned about dark money. I'm very concerned about PACs. Um, and I know that in the last election in Ward 3, there was a lot of frustration because there were there was more than one candidate who took huge amounts of money from developers. Uh, and with what we saw in Ward 3 with the, our, our golf course getting paved over, um, that's, that's a, a real sticking point. Um, I, I think that one of the things that the electorate should be demanding or voters should be demanding from they're the people who are wanting to run to represent them is that they do not as pursue the lowest possible standard that they can get away with which unfortunately we're already seeing in this race um but they aim for something higher and part of that for me if you go to that website that you just mentioned uh you'll see that i'm disclosing all of my donations as i receive them i'm 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 not just saying look i'm going to be honest with you because i think it's important i'm actually doing the work of being honest um i don't have any problems making my positions known uh which i think is another one because i don't i really try hard to recognize that there's in many of the issues that we're talking about there's a high level of complexity there's a high level of nuance and i don't believe in 10 word answers for, for for complicated problems like that. Uh, but I do believe that it's very important to make your position known. Uh, and I'm working very hard to do that. The other thing that I think is, is really important, and this is where I would argue that, that the current council has very much fallen down, is the communication pathways that exist between city council. Uh, and I would extend it even farther. I would be willing to say most elected representatives in Canada uh, are profoundly broken. I mean, we take a look at something as overblown is the word I'll use, 
uh, carefully. Uh, we take a look <laughs> at something as overblown as the guidebook. Um, the fact that there was a narrative that existed that there was no consultation done with the guidebook is patently false. I mean, we're talking about over, like, roughly a decades uh, worth of consultation. So to claim that there was no consultation say, and, and for people to buy that says to me, A, while there was consultation done, the results of that consultation were not effectively communicated. There were a lot of people who didn't realize that there was a consultation going on. And that is at its core communications problem. Uh, and while I recognize that the city has its own pathways for managing communication stuffs, I think that it is incumbent on elected officials to uh, do what they can to communicate and engage their constituents effectively. And I would, I would begrudgingly say that, and again, this is another person whom I have uh, significant philosophical difficulties with, but there is a city councillor who is known for hyperbole in theater, um, who does an amazing job of engaging his constituents. I would argue that that councillor also misleads them regularly. Um, but the, the reason why that councillor has gotten the traction that they have is because they do an effective job of engaging. They're not just using models that don't work anymore. Uh, and so I'm, you, you, you mentioned earlier that it's not a traditional campaign and you're absolutely right uh, because I do see the impacts of COVID as a, as a, as a healthcare worker and as a paramedic every single day. Um, and so I, I, my, I've been really forced to focus more on my air game. Uh, so I'm releasing videos every week uh, on specific issues. Uh, I'm releasing videos every week on where I stand on those specific issues. But the other thing that I'll just throw in before I take a breath uh, is I think that one of the biggest things that, that people look for is I've had people who disagree with me about issues, um, but because I've told them the truth, about where I stand and why I stand there. Fluoridation is a great example. Um, they have said that they're going to vote for me regardless, because I think that what people are looking for is they want to know that they can have that relationship and they can have that trust where their elected official will say, I hear you and I understand where you're coming from. Here's where I'm coming from. Here's why. Uh, and have that conversation as opposed to just saying, nah. What? Come on. I know, um, it's a crazy idea. What if we just told the truth? What would happen? It, it would break the system. Come on. You know that. You well, you literally have a show called The Breakdown. Okay. <laughs> so. That's, 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 that, that, that title works on multiple levels. It does. It does. <laughs> um, let, let's turn our attention here for a second to the state of the economy of Calgary. Uh, you mentioned Ward 3 has a very blue collar, very uh, skills trade uh, worker force, workforce up in Ward 3. Um, we have been hit by two major economic downturns, first with oil prices, second with COVID-19. The federal government, the provincial government have come out with their helps to small businesses and to the residents. I say helps, air quoting that right now. I can see um, I was joked on it. Exactly. Um, how can the municipal government and how can you, because this, as much as, as we said, Jason Kenney announced today the roadmap of the open to summer today, as we, uh, before we spoke, uh, before this episode was started to record, how can the city help residents and businesses on a municipal level going forward? Because this pandemic, while it might be ending vaccine-wise, the recovery is far from over. How can the municipality help? There's a lot of different ways. Um, one, of the, one of the big things for me, um, I've lived in, in Calgary now for three decades and change. Um, I, I wasn't, wasn't born here, but I largely grew up here. Um, one of the things that has always impressed me the most about this city is the fact that a we're resilient um it, and, I, and i'm not trying to invoke some sort of alberta or calgary exceptionalism um i think that we've be, we've become resilient largely out of necessity uh i look to the the response that calgarians offered up during the the 2013 floods 
Um, I had the privilege of being a frontline first responder. I was one of the first people who was deployed to evacuate people there. And from the very beginning, the way that community came together and supported each other and worked together for recovery uh, was probably one of the more humbling things that I've ever had the privilege to witness. Um, and I believe that spirit still very much exists. Uh, the, the big things that I think city council can do uh, is A, we need to stop talking about ourselves like we're beaten um, and, or, or that we're under attack uh, because I don't believe either of those things to be true. Um, the yes, we're seeing a massive paradigm shift in in uh, what our economy is going to have to look like, and and yes, that's hard and it's scary and all of that, and I do get that, but I think that part of the role of an elected official is to nav help their constituents navigate that fear uh, and and make them understand that that there are options. Uh, and that yes, things will be hard, but we're going to get through it. I think that that's, that's really critical. And that's not a tone of messaging that I've seen from any level of government uh, in, in quite some time, which is a source of great frustration for me. The other thing that I think that, that city council can do, and, and I'll give props to, to Councillor Chahal in particular for this one, that guy has been ripping it up with videos highlighting businesses in his communities. He's been ripping it up with videos about supporting local businesses. Uh, and, and those are things that I think that, that are well within the, the, the purview of, of a counselor. But more importantly, I think that what that kind of behavior demonstrates is, is some real leadership. And I think that what that behavior also demonstrates when, when elected officials don't buy into the hyperbole and the, the rhetoric, uh, and they, they, they do highlight the, the incredibly good things that happen in our communities um, and facilitate conversations about what economic shift is going to look like for Calgary. Uh, that sets a tone. And I think that that's something that we've really been missing because as you said earlier, it seems like politicians from all levels of government are, are most interested in pursuing free media, which is to me so dumb because everybody gets their information on social media now anyways. I get more traction off of a social media post than I do when I appear on traditional media. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the relentless pursuit of what's going to get me my 15 seconds on local radio station X, it, it not only is it toxic and does it cause long-term harm, but it's also just the, the ROI on it is a joke. Uh, and so that's, that's, that's part of the conversation. I think there's also a lot, I, I, I really do. And I know that everybody says this, um, but let's I, see if everyone says it because I've interviewed about 20 candidates so far. And if everyone said it, then I'll tell you. So go ahead. I really do love this city. Okay. Um, yes, they have all said that. Yeah, I know. Um, but I do. Uh, I, I, I have, because of my profession, I have lots of options for mobility. I, I have chosen to stay in Calgary because I, I do, I do love the city. I think that, that Calgary does have the properties and potential to be an example to the world of what a vibrant, exciting place to live and work can be. I mean, we have not only are we incredibly geographically blessed, um, you want to go to the desert, drive an hour east, you want to go to the mountains, drive an hour west, like it's, it's, we've, we've got all of the ingredients. Um, but I think that that we have, there are parts of Calgary that have embraced this victim mentality. Uh, that is just not the Calgary that I know. Um, and I think that, that we have s one of the jobs of council has to be conveying that to the world um, effectively, because we do have so, so, so much to offer. We have, uh, we have amazing, amazing people who, who, who live and work here um, to, I don't know why we're, we're focusing on the, Oh man, everything sucks uh, when we have so much going for us. Okay, so I, 
putting my former journalist hat back on here and it, it, it piggybacks onto the statement you just made. The narrative of the traditional media is crime, is drugs, is crime, uh, crim, uh, gangs. When I moved to Calgary, I was, I, th that's the first thing I did. Before we bought a house, I wanted to know where I was living. And the narrative of the area that I live in was, hey, the, the, the crime is high because the sea train's right beside it. Hey, there's lots of drugs. So how do you combat that narrative as well? Because you, on my street alone, there's four or four sales signs that have gone up in the last week. People are leaving this area. People are yep. leaving Calgary because oh, yeah. A, the toxic environment that the council has brought into the political discourse that is provincially, we've been hit a few times by the pandemic, via the economic downturn. So how do you change the narrative as one city councilor to bring people back to change that narrative of traditional media of, hey, we are not the crime ridden city that you think we are because we are not. I think that a big, there's, there's a couple of different things that can happen. And it's definitely a little bit more of an uphill battle because I mean, as, as a former journalist yourself, I'm sure you'd be happy to tell me that if you do a feel good story about puppies versus a, a story about 16 people got mowed down in the street, guess which one's going to get you more views, even with traditional media, get you more, more traction, which in turn translates into advertising revenue. So off we go. Um, so it, it is more challenging to, to celebrate the good things in the short term. But I think that that also speaks to the where the interest is is vested in. Uh, I think that there are no shortage of independent media uh, outlets, yourself, for example, uh, who are not interested in what's the driving factor isn't, OK, well, what's my advertising revenue going to look like for this episode or for this? Because you're not going to get any for this episode. <laughs> Uh, we have a sponsor, which oh, do you? I can't. Yes, we have officially became a sponsored show as of August first. We're in the process of finalizing the details, so once that happens, we'll. Oh, so you can't tell, you, tell me who it is. I can tell you after we stop recording. Okay, cool. <laughs> there you go, and we'll cut uh, this so part out. We'll some that's where the commercial will go. <laughs> maybe, maybe you'll get an, an email from your sponsor saying, "Why the hell did you have this guy on the show?" Um, but. I, I think that with the ubiquity of independent media, there, there are all sorts of channels that are available to tell positive stories. But I think that another part of that conversation is, again, the, the issues that you just talked about there, the, the drugs and the crime and all of that. Those are issues that do not exist in a vacuum. Um, those are issues that exist because there's something that has caused that. And that's part of the conversation that I think we need to have. Uh, and I think that there's definitely room for that conversation at a municipal level, because if we're talking about crime, well, why do why do people commit crimes? Well, the petty vandalism, sometimes people just do it because it's fun and they're bored, but the, the board piece can be addressed. And I think organizations like Vivo here in Ward 3 have historically done an excellent job of making kids less bored. Um, I would also argue that when we're talking about the some of the things that influence crime, like substance abuse, people having to maintain uh, an addiction, that is always coming from a place of trauma. And so if we're going to talk about, well, what causes crime? Well, addiction. What causes addiction? Well, trauma. OK, can we talk about that? Uh, and maybe we should talk about that more. I believe we should, um, because it's very, very easy to dehumanize any of those issues, but it's also incredibly counterproductive. Um, one of the, the anecdotes that I like to use when talking about the, the mental health and the addiction stuff that feeds so many of the things that you just listed off there uh, is when I'm in, in my career with uh, EMS, I've had the privilege of going uh, to elementary schools and, and reading kids our little coloring book about wearing helmets and answering questions and, and all that kind of stuff. And when I ask kids what they want to be when they grow up, usually the, the reaction is always policeman or firefighter and then someone realizes it's a paramedic in front of them and then somebody goes paramedic um, or, or pirate or, or, or space ninja or whatever. Um, no one says municipal no. politician, right? <laughs> I haven't heard that one. Um, but I've never heard a kid in school say, when I grow up, I want to be sleeping rough and having to do whatever I have to do in order to get my next fix. Because if I don't, I'm going to get dope sick and potentially die. I've never heard a kid say that. 
Um, and it's because there's a whole lot of factors that contribute to someone ending up in that position. And a lot of them, the municipal government does have the ability to impact. You bring up a good point because uh, we're coming up to the last few minutes of our sh uh, the episode, so I just want to try and sh uh, squeeze this in before I start wrapping up. But vagrancy and homelessness is a growing issue, and we've seen that massively due to these uh, downturns with the oil prices and with COVID-19. The disparity between the 1% and the other 99% is getting larger and larger. How has Ward 4 been able to help its citizens and how can you as a future city councillor help those who are less fortunate and who are having a hard time trying to find a home trying to find food trying to be uh, trying to get back on their feet because that is what they need is to get back on their feet so they can get a job get a home how can we help them as a councillor as a council but also in ward four how have you guys helped them as well well i i I can't speak very much to Ward 4. Ward uh, 3, sorry. <laughs> fudge, 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 fudge. I saw, oh my God. I, I'm cutting that part of the episode out. There'll be a dub of some random person saying Ward 3. <laughs> Just make it really obvious and I'll be happy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I think that there's some things that uh, City Council has done a fairly good job at. Um, and, and I'm going to get distracted by your dog now for a second. Um, <laughs> no, go. Okay, you don't. look so cute. Um, I think that there's a bunch of things that city council has done. I, I look at some of the support that they've put towards organizations like Be the Change YYC. Um, that's a good start. But I think the the biggest thing that council and and quite frankly anyone who cares about these issues who has a microphone needs to be doing is highlighting the fact that fundamentally. And I use that word too often, uh, so I think I only used it once in this conversation. Um, but first time, uh, look at me go. Uh, my my team will be very proud of me. Um, <laughs> fundamentally, I think that we're framing the conversation all wrong. Um, so the there is this perception when we talk about about homeless. Ho I'm sorry, houselessness, um, because I've been corrected on that, and I'm trying really hard to adopt it. Um, there is a perception that houselessness is a uh, outcome of bad choices. And that's false. Uh, it's just false. Um, and there's a there's also a perception that why should we waste money taking care of these people? Well, here's here's the bottom line. It's cheaper. That's it. That's the answer. It is cheaper to make sure that people have safe places to be than to constantly force them to go down emergency pathways in order to access services that cost more because they come from an emergency standpoint. And I'm not just talking about EMS. I'm talking about all of the different pathways that they have to access. There, the, the evidence is in that if we provide people with a safe place to be and to recover from whatever I'm going to call them comorbidities because that's a word we use a lot in Alberta now, um, has, has put them in that position. Uh, it's cheaper. So even if you completely divorce yourself from the moral imperative, which I absolutely believe exists, it is heartbreaking to me that there is anyone who is freezing to death or suffering physical injury from the elements because they don't have a safe place to be. That it, if, if, the, if the measure of any society is how we treat our weakened and our infirmed, we are not doing anywhere near as well as we should be right now. Um, but even if you want to ignore that moral imperative, um, because you have I don't know, different values than me or whatever, that's fine. But the economics of it are crystal clear. And so I am at a loss as to understand why we don't hear that conversation represented far more when we have city councillors or elected officials talking about this issue. The, the, it's, it's convenient to create that adversarial us versus them. They just made bad choices. We shouldn't have to carry them, yada, 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 garbage. Um, but the reality is, A, it's just the right thing to do. And B, it saves us money. So if we're choosing not to do those things, given that information, which a lot of people don't have because we haven't had the conversation that way, if we're choosing to not do those things with those two things in mind, that is a reflection on where we are, not where the people who are experiencing houselessness is. 
looking to the future, looking five years down the line, it is the end of your first term as Ward 3's counselor for the city of Calgary. What is the biggest issue that Calgary and Ward 3 have to overcome in the next five years? What is the issue? What is the defining issue that in one year, one term time, you can look at and say, you know what, we accomplished this. We are better off now than we were four years ago. Trust. Because without that, we have nothing. If we can't trust our elected officials, if we can't trust our elected representatives, if we can't have that conversation and that relationship, I mean, it, it goes down to the, the one of the foundational principles of our, of our government and our democracy is, is the consent of the governed. We're seeing to some degree what happens when we start to lose that. Uh, and that comes from a place of broken trust. And so I do not believe that anyone can move the needle in a substantial long-term way if they don't have that in place. Um, if I'm able to, there's, I mean, there's, I, 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 I do want to see economic recovery, but you can't have economic recovery without the buy-in of your constituents. I do want to see the green line get built, but you can't have the green line get built without the trust of your constituents. We can say the same thing for the arena. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on. So while there's many issues that, that I do want to see very much put to bed uh, over the next four years, the, if I had to put, pick one thing, I would like to say that I, if I'm elected, uh, I was able to demonstrate that you can conduct yourself as a politician as an elected official with honesty and integrity and transparency, and you can be accountable to the people who put you there. And if that's, that should not be a lofty goal, that should be the expectation. And if I'm able to move the needle in any way closer to that, I'm good. So in order to move the needle closer to that, people have to vote. People will have to get out on October 18th and advance polling to vote. So yes. my final question to you before we do the official wrap up is why should you be the next city councilor for Ward 3? I appreciate the way that you phrased that question, by the way. Um, I've, I, I've done a bunch of these and invariably there's a adversarial tone that gets put on that question. So I, I just want to really say that I appreciate the way that you phrased that. Um, here's the thing. I mean, at the end of the day, I have a long history of, of contributing to my community. I, I have volunteered for my community. I advocated for several years towards getting the, the, the high school built. I've sat on the board of directors for the Northern Hills Community Association. I have done countless benefit, benefits and benefit concerts to support not only uh, social issues like the ones that we talked about earlier, but ones that directly impact our community. Um, I have a, an established track record of caring about the place that I live in. Uh, and I would also like to think that I have an established track record of not engaging in the, the political theater and, and spin um, that, that, that some people do. I'm, I'm not part of a slate. I'm not part of a group of chosen candidates that people are, are putting forward to, to try to stack city council to their partisan benefit. Um, I'm just, I'm just, just trying to do what I'm trying to do, uh, and I, the fact that I am not just talking about honesty and transparency, but I'm doing the work of it with disclosing my donations. Uh, I'm, I'm making myself as available as I possibly. I mean, I'm, I'm doing my, I think, fifth Facebook Live uh, in a week and a half. Um, I, I intend to keep that going. Should I, should I be elected? Um, I'm, I'm not just saying the things I'm really trying to do the work. And I think here's, here's what I'll say. Here's my long winded rambling answer to that question. I apologize. Um, I am trying to be the kind of person that I want to vote for. And I would like to think that if I do the, the campaign, the way that I want to, other people will be able to see that. And, and hopefully they'll, that will help them make their decision when it comes to the, the ballot box. Awesome. Um, before we do go, I have one last thing to ask you. How can people reach out? How can people get involved with your campaign? Because campaign is through volunteers. So this yep. is your time. How can people get involved? 
So uh, the first place would be my website. Uh, you can visit that at www.natepike.ca. Uh, and then the I'm, I'm very easy to find on social media. I spend way too much time on Twitter um, just because that's we have COVID and I don't get to talk to people in person now. Uh, so my, my Twitter handle is at Nate Pike. I'm on the Instagram. Uh, I'm on Facebook. Uh, I, I do have a TikTok account, but I'm a middle-aged white guy. So my TikTok sucks. So I really wouldn't encourage anyone to, to jump over there and look for anything good for me. <laughs> I'm older than 10, so I don't believe in TikTok. So I will not even link TikTok in the show notes. There's there's some people, I got to say, there's some people who do it incredibly well. There's a young lady uh, who does political TikTok named Emma Didi. And man, that lady is on fire. Uh, the the stuff that she puts out, I wish I could be that consistently that that clever. Um, but I'm not. So don't don't go to my TikTok. Twitter, Facebook, but, Instagram, and the website. But for my listeners and to the viewers, the links to his Instagram, his Facebook, his Twitter, and his website will be in the show notes. I recommend if you are in Ward 3 to go over and check it out. But also, if you're just in Calgary, go over and check it out. And also, if you want to donate, and I've said this to all, about all the candidates, you can. Uh, Calgary residents are able to donate, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, through the changes of the provincial government, any Albertan can donate to the campaign. So yep, Up to uh, five thousand dollars there so, you go <laughs> um don't give me more than five thousand but i will take your five thousand <laughs> and he will publish your name on his website to be transparent in fairness though i just got to say with that as well um and i know that you're trying to, to get out of this but i've heard some people say that they're concerned about the election disclosure happening the way that i'm doing it all contributions need to be disclosed it's just a question of whether or not we do it before or after the election and i think that it's important that people know where my funding's coming from before they vote good for you well nate i want to thank you so much for doing this greatly appreciate it uh and like i said to my listeners and viewers the links will be in the show notes uh check them out greatly appreciate it for your time thank you <laughs>